Very nice. Um, just thinking about the tying in the, you know, our American holiday, the celebration of 4th of July, with our series in Exodus. And so let me give you a, a little parallel. Um, as we introduced last week, our 4th of July in, in America is a, is a celebration of independence or, or freedom and um, breaking away uh, 250 years ago. And in the Bible, the, the children of Israel, they break away from Egypt and from slavery. Their celebration was called Passover because the death angel would pass over the house and these people, after the Passover, they were uh, taken out of slavery. And so Passover became their freedom celebration, if you will. And so they celebrate that. And then 50 days after that, they would celebrate the giving of the law. So they became free. And then they were given the law, which we're going to read again today. And um, that kind of established uh, sort of like a foundation, if you will, for this new um, nation or gathering of, of people. So um, I know we've been there for a bit, and I'm going to move on soon. But um, I think it's worth spending one more week uh, at the foot of Mount Sinai going through uh, at least some more of the law. So let me start by just reading some of it, and, uh, and then we're going to look at how Jesus looked at the law and maybe how we should look at the law today, and um, we'll, we'll go from there. Exodus 20, and God spoke all these words. Again, they were not commandments at the time. They were statements, words. Um, conditions of reality. You can fight against reality if you want to, but it's probably smarter to learn what is reality and learn how to work with reality. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I got you here. Today, we, we recognize in America that we are here on somebody else's sacrifice, at least if you're awake in any way, you're aware of that. Awake emotionally, psychologically. If you think you brought yourself here with all the roads, I know you complain about them. It, the, anybody complain about the construction barrels already? Multiple times. Another, another approach is, thank God there's something to repair. And, and there's always a way to look at life. Somebody brought us here, and you're, you're, you're so soaked in, in, in goodness, and I am, fair enough, uh, guilty. We're so soaked in goodness that you know, human nature is we just look for something to gripe about. I brought you here. I'm the, I'm the God who brought you here. Have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Uh, honor your father and your mother, your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. And uh, these are what we know of as the Big Ten. Um, if, you, if you grew up Jewish, you know that if you keep reading, there's a whole bunch more. And there's 613. 613. So just for grins, I looked up how many laws are there in America. It's kind of hard to find a good answer, so maybe you, some of you know these things. But uh, the number that, that I could come up with was somewhere around 30,000. So... It's a bit of work for us. Uh, Jesus famously was asked, of all the commandments, you know, what are, what are, what's most important? And he replied, he picked, he picked two of the 613, and neither one of them were in the Ten Commandments, coincidentally, but um, love the Lord your God with all your heart, right? 
And a second one he picked was, uh, that one was from Deuteronomy. The other one he picked was from Leviticus, love your neighbor as yourself. And famously, Jesus said, if you do these, um, all the other commandments hang from them. And they really do. If you operate in love, you're going to do the, the right thing. But the problem is, sometimes we don't operate in love, we hide behind that. And so sometimes things have to get specific. In other words, I could tell Charlie, hey, just love mom and dad and love your neighbors and do whatever else you want. It probably wouldn't go well. You have to get what? Specific. Speaking of, Charlie broke four of the Ten Commandments by 10 a.m. this morning. <laughs> four of them, I counted. Somehow she's been watching something, I don't know, or hearing at school or whatever, but she's in this new thing. Literally, it, and it's just God's justice that I'm up here talking about the Ten Commandments. And you know what she starts saying constantly? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Turn around. Where did she learn this? She says it just like, I want cereal. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. So somewhere she's learned this, and, I, and you know, Vicky and I were saying, how exactly are we going to handle this? Anybody know what I'm saying? We got our work cut out for us, but it, it's, it, it's better than that. And then we got into the car, coming to church today, and she says to me, Dad, now, by the way, um, I, have, I have personally constructed one sweet tree house in our backyard. I mean, it's sweet. We're talking state of the art. <laughs> and if you know that my skills, you just could imagine the level of quality. So I was thinking that she really appreciated it and everything, and we got in the car, and we're just ready to focus on the Ten Commandments and church and all these wonderful things. She says, Dad, all the other kids have nice playhouses in their backyard. As we're driving around, you could see all the ones that came from Costco and the thing, and they got the green tented thing at the top and the professional climbing wall and the road. She says to me, all the other kids have these kinds of houses. Why can't I have one of those? And I said, well, first of all, they all cost $8,000 a piece. Come <laughs> on, yours cost $8. Scrap wood, <laughs> true story, scrap wood. I found in barns and different places, leftover nails. Yesterday, she was up there pounding nails like this, so I wanted her to have the experience of doing it with me, you know. I have these fanciful ideas as if that's going to really make us bonded together somehow. And she's up there, like, hammering her own little treehouse at four years old. And so, check. Commandment number two, thou shalt not covet your neighbor's treehouse. Certainly, by the derogatory way in which she talked about the treehouse I built for her, she was not honoring her father. <laughs> Number three, I could go on, if you know what I mean. But it makes you think about how do we actually look at these? And I think we really should because I think you kind of have choices. You, you know, the choices society has seemed to make is mostly just ignore them, kind of make up your own. And that's a bit of a problem because then who makes them up? And how do you decide if they're authoritative? You say, but, but we'll set that aside for a minute. I think some people have looked at, well, well, didn't Jesus just do away with those? And that's actually not true either because Jesus said things like um, the other commandments hang on those. And he said, he said, um, you know, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. So I, these are questions I've been thinking about. Maybe you can think about them this week if you want. First question is this. How are these commandments in some way for me? Because Jesus said something really great in in the New Testament, when they broke the Sabbath, at least in the way that, that was understood by people in that day, um, you know, you can only walk so far on the Sabbath, you can only do certain things on the Sabbath, and you have to decide what can you do and what can't you do. And there's an extensive, extensive list of laws. And Jesus broke those a couple of times. But he said something very telling. He said, 
man wasn't made for the Sabbath. Right? The Sabbath was made for man. In other words, here's this law. God didn't make us so that we could do a bunch of his rules. But he made the rules to do something to help us. That is to say, there's something in that rule that's beneficial to me. Are you with me so far? So the question would be, if I were to take a serious stab at these, a serious dive at these, the question would be, first of all, have I thought about how each one of these could be beneficial to me? Because I think the way we think about it when we're young, or maybe the way I did when I was young, was just complete terror, complete fear. If I broke these, God was going to just come down and smite me, and that would not be good. And I didn't think about them being for my benefit. So a starting point might just be this. How could this be for my benefit? I mean, the first one seems like completely egotistical of God. Have no other gods before me. As if God is so needy that he just can't stand it. Or, or is there something incredibly life-giving about putting God first and foremost in your life? So we introduced the idea last week, and, and sorry, it's, the whole series is a bit rambling, if you will. If you just came in for today, you might need to go back and watch and kind of piece them together. But we threw out this idea that, you know, they would read the law every year, and they would recommit themselves every year. So you had the Passover celebration, and then you had the Shavuot, which was... The, the giving, celebration of the giving of the law. And then if you were Jewish, as Jesus was, you would recommit yourself every year to following it. You consented. Yes. Yes. I'm going to follow it. Fifty days after. Later on in the church, that became known as the day of Pentecost. So on that day... The early church, as one scholar has taught, or a few, that the early church started to read not just the laws of Moses, but then they started to read the teaching of Jesus alongside. In other words, it was like, here's what Moses said, and here's how Jesus interpreted it. That's a good way of thinking of it. So you went to church, and it was like, oh, or to synagogue, and you were like, this is the, the reading of the law, and then you would read something like the Sermon on the Mount next to it. It would be Jesus' way of interpreting it, which it starts to get really rich here. Because Jesus said things like this in the Sermon on the Mount. He said something like this. You've heard it said, right? Do not murder, one of the Ten Commandments. But I say to you, here's the interpretation, right? I say to you, don't be angry with your brother. So he takes it a step further on with a lot of different ones. But what about this law? Have no gods before me. Listen to the interpretation of Jesus here. Seek first, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you. All these things. What are the things? Things are the things that you are thinking about right now, besides listening to me. Things are the things that you're thinking about tomorrow morning when you get up. They're the things that bother you, that hang on your head, that worry you, that stress you, that concern you, that bother you. The things that you always go back to that your mind wanders to. He says, seek first, and all these things will be given to you. Do you know what the context of this is? When Jesus does the teaching on worry, he says this, therefore, don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink or what you're going to wear or what's going to happen on Tuesday or your social media account or don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. You know what I think it is? I think when we finally get the first, the first things right, I think the benefit of that commandment is it frees us from worry. I don't have to worry. God's here. 
I don't, I'm not worried about it. But what's going to happen? doesn't matter. God's here. God says, seek first. All these things will be what? Given to you. I'll take care of everything. You think about it like, do I want Charlie to worry? I want to worry about where her next meal's coming from. Do I want to worry about if she's going to be safe? No, the first thing you want to do is you want to reassure you. There's nothing to worry about. I will take care of it. Right? God's saying to you, saying this to you, just get God in the right place in your life. A lot of times what I worry about is when people say, oh, all I have to do is love God and love my neighbor, which we preach relentlessly at Orchard Grove, constantly. If you've been here, you know that's just the mantra. But what I'm concerned about sometimes is they just do a quick check mark. Of course I love God. It's an easy pass through. And then it's like, have I really thought about putting God at the high place in my life, the important place? Not because of God's need, but because of my own. Because if not, I'm going to be consumed with anxiety and what? Worry. If God's at the high place, worry, anxiety, all these other things, they start to fall away. Now, some of you don't believe me, so let me just read something that I ran into this week. It's about the word awe, because when the law comes, there's a lot of shock and awe. There's thunder and lightning and rumbling and fire. Certainly, it's an awe-inspiring scene. There is no doubt about it. And I think what we need in our culture is a healthy sense of awe about God and about these the word awe is defined as a feeling of reverential respect mixed with wonder or fear. That's just Oxford Dictionary. So just, just for grins, because people have always asked me, well, it always says fear the Lord, fear the Lord. And it does, and, and we should, but we should understand what that really means. It's inspiring awe. Then, get this, they did research, and recent psychologists have studied awe investigating the potential health, mental health benefits of experiencing awe. Something that makes you quake a little bit. Something so beautiful, so inspiring. Studies show, right, that like the University of Arkansas has done studies. These are actual psychologists doing studies on what does it mean to have that reverential fear. I... I <laughs> I just thought that was a beautiful prayer of Jolene talking about how the, like the doors are kind of closed here, closing you off from all that, the chaos that's out there. And, you know, if you come in here and you have a moment of reverence and a moment of holy awe, what it can do for you. It says that studies have found it can boost life satisfaction, reduce anxiety, and even make people feel like they have more time. Go figure. In other words, the first question that I'm trying to, my, myself, is to discover as I go through each one of these is to go, what's the, what's the for me part of this? Jesus said, the Sabbath is for you. That's actually a really deep thought when you, when you probe it for a minute because you think, I, I really should give some thought to how these have deep benefits for me. Whether I can squeak by with, with following them or not following them. I mean, that's what we did when we were like 14. Your mom gave you a rule. You figured your way around the rule. Or you figured a way to follow it just enough to somehow make yourself legitimate in mom's eyes. But you didn't look at it like, what's the benefit that mom has for me here? But we're getting older, you know, we're, we're, we're maturing. By the, time, by the time we get to Jesus and we get to the New Testament, you see this move. You see this move towards grace and spirit and forgiveness. Because certainly, you and I, just like Charlie, we break these rules. So let's just get that out right away. So I'm not up here pretending that I never break any of them. Are we good on that? 
I, I don't try, it's not my practice to wake up and see how many I can break, but the reality is that I do. And the reality is that you do. And so we need something called grace. Like my, my grandma, who, as many of you know, she's 100 now, and she, she's the one that gave me my first Bible. She was the one that talked to me about God and took me to church. And uh, I mean, my grandma was absolutely my spiritual rock and foundation. And we were sitting in uh, her uh, kind of living room on the floor of her nursing home there the other day, and she said to me, she's not going to church anymore. Now, now just think about this. Like, yeah, I mean, you know what I mean? Like, you don't know what that's like coming from her because, I mean, that's all she ever talked about. Like, if one of my brothers wasn't going to church, something like that, she'd pull me aside and say, I'm really worried about your brother because I, I, don't, I don't think he's going to church right now. You know, and I have to talk and, like, I, I have to be worried but kind of stand up for my brother a little bit. I think he's, he's getting around to it, Grandma, you know. And, and she'd have talks with me about everybody. Anybody, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Like your family like this, or am I just up here alone today? Like she would talk to me, and she like, and then to sit there and her to say, you know, it's just, I just, I just don't really feel like getting up anymore. Now, what I did to this is what I did. I got out my Bible and I showed her the Ten Commandments. No, I did not. Of course I. <laughs> Of course you do not. Of course, immediately in your heart, you just feel nothing but what? Grace, compassion. Oh, she's 100 now. She just doesn't even feel like getting up on Sundays. For, you don't bring judgment. So what do we do here? This is so important. Because some, sometimes what happens is people get all law happy. They find the law. They get locked in it. They get rigid. They get stubborn. They get religious. They get annoying and are stuck. And how do you marry that with grace, with forgiveness, with spirit, with getting the spirit of the law? I think there's a, there's a, a thing that Jesus taught most of all, it's called wisdom. And wisdom is something like this. Wisdom is like knowing how to hold on to this and to embrace this. Wisdom is somehow knowing how to do law and grace. Wisdom is somehow the, the, the mixing of justice and mercy. Wisdom is somehow knowing how to make them all come together. If you've ever read like in the book of Acts, in the book of Acts, it's Acts chapter 2. It's, it talks about on the day of Pentecost. What's the day of Pentecost? Well, by the New Testament, it's the time they give the law. It's the time they, they celebrate receiving the law and committing themselves to it. They were all together in one place. And they heard the sound of like a, a violent wind. And it was shaking this house and they saw what appeared to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest in all these people. Well, you have the tongues of the fire. You have the, 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 the loud wind. You have all of this stuff on the day of Pentecost. It is a repeat of Mount Sinai. Now, this is, this is key if you're ready for it. Only if you're ready for it. What happened on Mount Sinai was God came to the mountain. And everybody said, that's where God was. And then later on, they made a tent for God to live in. That was called the tabernacle. And later on, King Solomon made a house, a more permanent structure. That was called the temple. Stay with me. Stay with me. Just a quick review. Anybody ever been in like a college class and you have no idea what's going on? <laughs> like besides me? I mean, like, I, I do not belong in this class. Has that ever happened to you? So I, I don't mean to skip past things, but just, the, okay. Mount Sinai, God comes to the mountain. Ready? And then later on, he moves into the tabernacle, which we're going to get to in a little bit. And then later on, he moves into the temple. In Acts 2, there were tongues of fire that came, and they, the fire went and went on the head of all of the believers. What happened? God moved again. Where did God move? 
into the hearts of all the believers. God changed addresses. One of the most powerful things you will ever understand about the whole story of the scripture is that last move right there when God moved into here. We like to say here God is with us, for us, and ultimately God is what? In us. That's why Paul started to write things in the New Testament like you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that God resides inside of you. Think about this move. Now, what you and I do, I'm a temple of God's spirit. What an awe-inspiring thing that is. That God resides inside each and every one of us. A temple of God. That doesn't mean... I throw away everything that I got when I was young or every foundation that was built. But what it does mean is this. From now on, I can live from spirit and from heart. Why? Why do we have 30,000 laws that you will never know and never read in your lifetime and yet you've, in theory, committed to following? Because you just can't make enough laws. You just can't make enough. At some point, it has to come where? Here. There has to come a point where it comes here. And the deep abiding sense is this, that I'm God's child. I will put him first. I will love the Lord with all of my heart. I will love my neighbor as myself. And that law reaches its fulfillment and its climax there. They were, I don't know if you remember this part of the story, but they were etched in stone. That's pretty heavy, you know? And I think if we get it right, we get the foundation right. The stone, we all need the foundation. The carved in stone, that, that kind of means it's not supposed to change very often. It's supposed to stay here for a while. But later on, as you follow the story of Scripture, it says God's going to put the law in their hearts. It's going to come here. So here's the challenge going forward. Not to abandon these. I I, I think, if anything, the reason I paused for so long around the Ten Commandments and around the law, we haven't been able to even get into many other ones, is this. Because I think what we've done is we've just glossed over them too quickly. To try to jump to the New Testament. To try to jump to grace. And it's just like the development of a human being or a child. When they're young, you don't start with that. You start with black and white. You start with hardcore law. You etch it in stone. Do not ever, ever, ever cross that road. Anybody with me? Because there's a busy road in front of our house. Don't ever cross that road. Ever. Unless I'm holding your hand. Right? No. When she's 36... She's getting ready to go on her first date. <laughs> then, okay, you can go. Right. Things have to go, they have to go over time. They have to change. But, but you, you have to get the right order. And, and the thing that can mess us up is if we just start here and we have no foundation. Or if you're all foundation and you're, you're, you don't like grace and spirit. But what wisdom does is somehow it can hold them both. That's the beauty. You start here. Now, like, you get older, you can understand things like nuance, grace, compassion. Um, you know, Lark, Charlie's now figured out the red, what red lights are. Dad, stop. It's red. I'm like, well. Okay, but I just want to get up to the car to stop up there. Like, if we're, you know, 17 car lengths back and she sees the red light, she wants me to stop. I'm like, well, I'm just going to get up to the car and then I'm going to stop. Then she's very literal. And then right turn on red has been a tough one to explain to her. <laughs> she very much feels like I'm a criminal. <laughs> she's, oh, she's very concerned about it. Uh, the police officer's gonna get us, Dad. I'm like, well, there's a, you know. 
How many know there's right turn on red? How many know there's Jesus healing on the Sabbath? How many know there's grandma sleeping in on Sunday? How many know there's grace after grace after grace after grace after grace? I think our greatest challenge is to live with wisdom. Because you don't want to skip the foundation. But you don't want to miss this either. Where abundance of God's love and his mercy, where God's law just comes in here, and you don't feel any obligation at all. You just feel pure love. Like, I just want, I, I, I just want to. I just want to. I just, it's the right thing. Let's stand. We'll have a closing prayer. I was going to say a prayer for God, for wisdom for all of us. Because I feel like what happens a lot of times in our life is we just get caught in one polar extreme. Sometimes a society that's just thrown out any foundation whatsoever. I, I don't think that's good. I don't think that's healthy. And sometimes people get locked in legalism and that's where you have these overbearing religions and intolerable rules but wisdom to humbly hold on to both to gracefully move through life and maturity so that you know or as it was said best I, I think this was know the law so well that you know how to break it that's good that if you're at a red light and you look both ways and no one's coming and it's completely safe, but you see someone over in the left and they're drowning in the lake and the only wise and helpful and wonderful thing to do is to absolutely run that light to save a life, then you got it. Spirit, wisdom, grace. We're saved by grace. So God, we bow before you for a moment of awe, recognizing that you're above us, that we should have no other gods there. That if we put money, you said, we can't serve you and money. We can't serve you and something else. It needs to be just you. We put you there right now in the high place first. Bless us with the peace that follows that as we cast our worries away by putting you there. And God, give us wisdom. All of us know it who struggle in life with, with raising kids or advising, helping with grandkids or, or just growing up in a difficult world. Give us wisdom. to hold on to the foundation while we move into grace. In Christ's name, we thank you. Amen. Amen. God bless Orchard Grove. Happy Sunday. Jesus, we love.